Now we're going to be talking about pyloric stenosis. And pyloric stenosis results when the circular area of muscle that surrounds the pylorus, it hypertrophies. And it basically obstructs gastric emptying because it becomes very stenotic. There's a very, very small opening. As you can see in the picture on the right, you can see where the duodenum is here, stomach, and here's the pylorus. So, and then the pyloric stenosis is in here instead of being um, maybe three times the opening of that, three or four, depending on how bad it hypertrophies. Um, then when the baby eats, you won't have, you won't have that gastric emptying from the stomach. Usually this happens more often in, in families that um, the mom or the dad may have had it. It, the, the baby's not born with it. The baby, it usually um, hypertrophies around the four to eight weeks of, of age. Um, and these are really, really fussy babies, and we'll get into the, um, the signs and symptoms in a minute. But usually, um, it occurs more often in male infants, and it's also associated higher in white infants than in African American or in Asian infants. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, hereditary, heredity and family predisposition seem to increase that risk of pyloric stenosis as well. I can remember um, when my first son was born, being a pediatric nurse all those years, and I just knew that he had pyloric stenosis because the child, he really had GERD, and you know, GERD really wasn't a uh, a disease of fashion back then you know he just it was like he just ate too much and but he had one projectile vomiting and you know I took him right away and he was fine he, he was gaining weight he was you know everything was fine with him but you know when you have babies that have GERD or um, mamas you know mamas get real protective of their babies and as we all know so Here's the, the signs and symptoms of a child with pyloric stenosis. As you, as you can just see from the patho, they'll have progressive projectile vomiting, and it is forceful projectile vomiting to the point where you have to ask the parent, you know, how far did it go? Did it, it just didn't seep out of the mouth? It, it projected out of the mouth. And this happens especially after eating. Um, Sometimes you can, on palpation, in the right upper quadrant, you have a firm olive-shaped mass that can be felt. And that's usually just before they eat, you can maybe feel that and maybe just kind of putting the baby on your lap and having the head hang down just a little bit. Maybe you can feel it. Sometimes you can't feel it at all. And the, it's okay on if you don't feel it because a lot of times you don't. Um, you may have, you also may see visible peristaltic, peristaltic waves from the left to the, to the right upper quadrant immediately before the baby vomits. Um, I saw, and I didn't include it in, on Blackboard, but I had seen one on YouTube, and you know, that baby was just so, so um, malnourished. And that was the only way that you could see it, but it was just like a ball that went from the left side to the right side. These babies are dehydrated. They have absence of tears. You're going to note that. A weak cry, depressed fontanelle. Remember that anterior fontanelle has not closed, so we want to make sure that we, we assess that. A poor skin turgor, dry mucous membranes. Um, and they can also develop metabolic alkalosis and you know you're not going to be responsible for you know what the pH is going to be and all of that but but just know that these are very very sick babies and usually they come into the hospital or if they haven't been diagnosed yet with uh, what they call failure to thrive FTT um, and w the we need to find out exactly what what's going on with them when they come in with that because that's just a preliminary diagnosis and maybe because they haven't um, haven't put on uh, as much weight. It's usually one to two pounds per week. 
and they're just very irritable babies very very irritable they're very hungry very very hungry it's almost like a cardiac baby you know that you'll see but with this one you're going to see that projectile vomiting and that's very very um, that's a hallmark you know sign of, of this disorder so on our diagnostic assessment we'll do that history of vomiting those visible peristaltic waves palpable pyloric mass if you can see that the doctor or the nurse practitioner will order an x-ray ultrasound is the is the gold standard um, it's very um, non-invasive and they may do a barium swallow they may not um, they'll may they may do an ABG especially if this baby comes in is severely dehydrated um, we'll also look at our electrolytes they usually have decreased serum potassium and sodium levels from you know vomiting and not being able to digest um, their formula correctly increase pH um, and sodium bicarb and they'll have decreased chloride their indirect bilirubin may be elevated indirect just means that it hasn't gone to the liver yet to be processed and to be eliminated so that may be or may not be elevated it's not one of the one of the key uh, blood work that we look at but we definitely look at um, our electrolytes with these babies so if they come in and usually you know mamas are a lot more astute I guess than than we used to be but usually this is this can be done um, because surgery is the is the um, the intervention of, cho of, of for these babies so they'll do a py pylorotomy and this is j the incision of a pyloric of the pyloric muscle to release the obstruction that's and it's usually done it's done by um, laparoscopy if the child comes in though and is severely dehydrated they're going to manage the IV fluids and electrolyte replacement before they take this baby to surgery probably, they'll also put in an NG tube for um, stomach decompression and that's really important um, to stop the vomiting and that usually does stop it um, so they'll have their NG tubes you know maybe to gravity or to suction um, and our pre and post op care um, is on page 437 you can um, read that but basically our post op care is very very important to follow the physician's orders because when this baby comes back he may or may not have an NG tube just just to keep um, keep the stomach decompressed maybe for maybe for about 12 to 24 hours and then they'll start with um, and they usually have a very specific regimen of how they're going to be starting the um, the fluids with these babies and they'll start maybe with um, just some Pedialyte and they'll be real specific of 15 mls the first 30 minutes see how the baby does you know it's about monitoring that baby and making sure that the baby has no vomiting that the um, the baby has no fever and the baby is gaining weight as um, as the days go by and the baby's tolerating fluids so that's real important for mamas to know that and, and make sure that they know the the feeding regimen when they go home I think it used to used to be a little bit more regimented than it than it is maybe now but but at least every six hours you know they should be fed and and managed and make sure that the um, parents follow up with their um, appointments very important so in our nursing diagnosis of course we're gonna have fluid and electrolyte deficit that's related to vomiting it's usually that metabolic alkalosis um, we're gonna have a it's a failure to thrive I mean the, these children are just um, little they can be emaciated if, if it's left and nothing's been done about it but I think parents now are a lot more astute about getting their their children in getting their babies in and usually that one month visit is very very important and it's important as a nurse for you to elicit 
you know, any problems with feeding, especially if you're a peds nurse and it's a new mama or even a third third baby, you know, so got to make sure that um, on the growth chart that they are increasing their weight to one to two pounds every week. Alteration in nutrition, less than body requirements related to that vomiting, and, you know, that's kind of self-explanatory there. Um, I think it's, let me just look here. Um, on evaluation, you want to just make sure, you know, that the child has um, a good skin turgor, um, the fontanelle is flat, it's not bulging or it's not depressed, They're, they have moist mucous membranes, their urine specific gravity is less than 1030, as you know 1005 to 1030 is normal, and a sodium level within normal limits, that's important in their potassium. And make sure that the child's tolerating oral feedings without any vomiting, and make sure that, that the child's weight has returned to pre-illness level, and it, that usually should happen within a week. Make sure that the surgical site is clean, dry, and intact, and without any drainage or any redness. And um, can the parents explain the need for that surgery? And as you evaluate, can, can they explain the need for surgery and routine uh, pre-op and post-op care, especially, you know, on going home? And is the child calm? Is the child content? Is the child free from any pain? And make sure that you address that with the physician, you know, if, if there's something when the when the baby goes home or you, you think the baby's still in pain that he he or she may may need something. And um, and just just kind of assess the assess the family unit and um, see how they're doing and, and see how the stress of having a baby in surgery, you know, for the very first two months of life is very, very stressful for for our families. So, okay, so that does it for, for pyloric stenosis. Okay, now we're going to be talking about intussusception. And intussusception is an invagination of a section of the intestine into the distal bowel that causes a bowel obstruction. If you look at um, page 438, it has the pathophysiology of intussusception, and it basically the bowel kind of telescopes inside the ascending colon, and it's usually uh, where the cecum and the ileum kind of meet, That's and you can see where the appendix is on here. But that's that's usually the area that's that's involved. What will happen is during this um, having this obstruction will cause bleeding in that that very very characteristic current jelly stool. Um, the blood vessels around that area um, become trapped between the layers of the intestines, and the blood flow decreases, which then causes edema and inflammation. You can have strangulation of the bowel, which causes gangrene, causes sepsis, and shock and and death if uh, we don't take care of this really quick. So, it is one of the most common causes of intestinal obstruction, especially in children between the ages of three months and six years. So we see pyloric stenosis, which is another type of obstruction, but we see that usually between four and eight weeks of age, but this is about three, three months to six years. In young children, the cause of intussusception is unknown. Um, you can uh, some of the contributory uh, factors include maybe a pre-existing upper respiratory tract infection or um, some other kind of viral infection. If it's seen later in older children, there may be a mass or maybe some anatomical um, defect. Uh, Intussusception generally affects the infants and young children with about 80% of cases before the age of two, and rarely, like I said before, before the age of three months. It is more commonly seen in boys than in girls, and children that have cystic fibrosis are at increased risk for intussusception. So here are some of uh, the manifestations or the, the classic signs and symptoms 
um, or the passage of that bloody stool called a current jelly stool and diarrhea and that sausage shaped abdominal mass that may be palpated. You also, um, this, this child is usually well nourished and without any other history of a GI problem. But what happens is you'll, you'll have those paroxysmal pains, pains that comes, comes and goes, that become more constant as time progresses during the first several hours. And then it can become a more constant, severe pain. And the child may, may um, vomit at that time. Uh, symptoms of shock and sepsis are present if, if the obstruction has lasted more than um, 12 to 24 hours. The child can be listless. Um, older children may have pain with maybe at, without any other symptoms. So fever, um, increased heart rate, changes in LOC. You know, children children are wonderful to take care of because, you know, they don't come up with any signs or symptoms. It is what it is. You can always tell that a child is very, very sick by, um, if, the, if the child's not playing and the child is, you know, all, the children always play. Um, if they're just laying around, they're listless, lethargic, that's just not normal. Those are signs and symptoms of, of dehydration, possibly shock, and possibly sepsis if this is um, if this is longer uh, than 12 to 24 hours. So our goal is basically to restore um, the bowel to its normal position and function. And basically, we're going to be doing abdominal um, X-rays. Uh, they may show an abnormal gas pattern related to the bowel obstruction or a soft tissue mass. Ultrasound is used in identifying the location of the intussusception and the amount of edema that's in that area. Um, and a definitive diagnosis. This is really a cool thing because we can do a definitive diagnosis can be made and the treatment for this um, provides that simultaneously with a barium enema or an air enema examination. So if you can just imagine if we had barium, we gave an enema and it basically pulls that part of the, um, the intestine and it pulls it down because of the weight of the barium and it, it, it gets rid of the telescoping of, of the bowel. In our nursing diagnosis, we'll have ineffective tissue perfusion that's related to the GI bowel um, compression and acute pain related to bowel obstruction and, and surgery. Um, what you have to remember is hopefully this will, this will fix the problem. Um, if not, then we'll have to do a lap uh, laparoscopy, laparoscopic surgery, I'm sorry. Um, if the enema fails to reduce the intussusception, and um, but usually the the success rate um, states that it's 80 to 95 percent success rate when they do that what they call the hydrostatic reduction with a barium enema or an isotonic saline or an air enema an enema under um, ultrasound guidance. Um, but if that fails, they have to take them to surgery immediately. So on our assessment, we are looking at a previously healthy infant who suddenly began crying, flexing the legs in severe pain. Um, the problem may resolve only to reoccur a short time later, and then it becomes more constant as, as the child gets worse. So the nurse should assess any child for a bowel obstruction with, with signs of vomiting, nausea, abdominal distension, hypoactive or hyperactive bowel sounds, that palpable abdominal mass, that passage of current jelly stool will confirm the diagnosis. So it's very important that we be astute on looking at, at the stools and asking or asking the parent exactly what they look like. Make sure that you, uh, you assess hydration you assess for fever, any increased heart rate that 
that decreased LOC that we talked about before, um, blood pressure, respiratory distress, all of those should be reported immediately to the physician. And that's very important. Um, so po um, postoperatively, when um, we want to make sure that we keep the patient MPO until the bowel function returns. Sometimes they'll have to have an intermittent um, NG tube suction, IV therapy, pain, just depending if they've had to have surgery or if they've just had the, the, um, the barium enema that has reduced the telescoping. So this is very, very frightful for patients because these little ones get sick very, very quickly. And, but we can help them, you know, we just be, have to be real astute and, and um, make sure that we report any signs or sim symptoms of sepsis or, um, or shock on these little ones. Okay, the next one we're going to go over in this, in this slide series is volvulus. And volvulus is a condition that's caused by malrotation or twisting of the bowel that results in a bowel obstruction. And it usually is the result of a defect in fetal development. It's the midgut, which normally rotates about 270 degrees around the superior mesenteric artery, which fails to rotate and fix itself to the abdominal wall. So affected infants usually um, manifest pain. They'll have bilious vomiting. And so that's the difference between when you're going to see the um, pyloric stenosis you know, um, and intussusception. So they'll have bilious vomiting. Whereas our pyloric stenosis patients, remember that they... Um, the stomach contents has not been um, the stomach contents has not been digested, so we have undigested formula. Whereas with this infant, we'll have bilious vomiting. Okay, so I want you to make sure that you kind of have a working knowledge of that. Um, they have other other signs also of bowel obstruction that we've talked about before. Um, surgery is essential to prevent the bowel ischemia, and um, and the nursing care is similar to to that with um, with intussusception afterwards. Just making sure that there's no fever. We, we're monitoring their weight, their INO, looking for um, any vomiting. Probably have an NG tube in to suction. Um, listen for bowel sounds slowly, slowly, slowly. We'll introduce um, fluids again for them. So um, just review the post op care for intussusception, and it, it's basically the same. So, but the, the signs, the symptoms, or all these obstructions are going to be a little bit different. And we'll see, we'll see that also in Hirschsprung's disease that we'll talk about next. Okay, thanks.